It's time for Drummer Nation. Hi, this is your host, Michael Vosbein, with a few changes I'd like to talk about before we get the show rolling. I was doing a new interview show every week, and it just seemed like they were, they were too close together. I wanted to take a great artist like Harvey Mason and many of the others and give them some chance to breathe and be seen. So I'm going to be doing these Drummer Nation podcast interview shows every two weeks. However, I'm supplementing that with a Facebook Live Drummer Nation show every week. Those will be on the Facebook Drummer Nation page, not my personal page, the Drummer Nation page for Facebook, and it'll be Drummer Nation Live every Wednesday at 1 o'clock. Please join me there and participate as we discuss all things drum, drumming, and drummers, and uh, look for the podcast, the interview pre-recorded shows, to come out every other week, uh, also on Wednesdays. So make a note of that, please. And uh, with that said, on with the show. Thanks for watching. One of the most sought after jazz and R&B drummers of his generation, Lil John Roberts has maintained his status in the industry as the ultimate heartbeat. His list of credits include industry greats such as Stevie Wonder, Quincy Jones, Prince, Sheila E., Mary J. Blige, Janet and Michael Jackson, Elton John, Patti LaBelle, and a host of others. John's television credits include Saturday Night Live, The Queen Latifah Show, and American Idol, as well as Oprah, Leno, Letterman, Ellen, Kimmel, and the rest. John works nonstop with artists such as Herbie Hancock, George Benson, Boney James, and Kurt Whalen. I caught up with him enjoying some time off at his home in Atlanta. Sound Synergies Percussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. Check out their website at soundsynergies.net. I absolutely love playing drums and I couldn't imagine uh, not having that in my life. And I really, uh, if I could fac help facilitate that and have an impact on your life so that you can play drums, that means the world to me. Hi, this is Stanton Moore. I've been playing and teaching drums for over 30 years. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Hi, this is Michael Vosbein, your host for Drummer Nation, and I do the show as a labor of love, but I could use a little help. If you'd like to be a patron of the show, please go to the site patreon.com slash drummer nation help us out thanks little john roberts welcome to drummer nation and thank you for doing my show how are you i'm great man good to be here thanks for having me well i'm uh, sorry we've never met you live in atlanta and so do i how long have you been here uh since 94. what moved you here um well coming from philadelphia going to boston to study at berkeley college of music i was coming back and forth to atlanta and doing shows and met a lot of the producers that were like, you know, doing most of the big artists in Atlanta at the time, Dallas Austin, Jermaine Dupri, I met mm -hmm. Organized Noise, who was doing a lot of songs as well, producing a lot of songs. So I got uh, really in a good relationship with those people and started playing for their artists and were doing their records. And then it just made sense to like move to Georgia. <laughs> well, beautiful. I'm glad you did. I'm glad you stayed here. Uh, we need great drummers in this city, um, like we're doing world-class stuff. Yeah. There aren't that many. Um, let me ask you a bit of your background. You're from Philadelphia, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you grew up with Joey D? Yeah. Joey D. Francesco, he's a friend of mine. I love his playing. Yeah. And um, uh, Christian McBride. Yeah, my boy. <laughs> so, so as a very young age, you guys were playing together in trios? Yeah, we, we had a jazz trio that we did um, the Music Fest USA every year because we, we were in an all-city jazz band configuration that um, a guy named um, Mr. Bill Whitaker was the uh, director of. And um, every year we would go to this downbeat competition called Music Fest USA. And for about three years consecutively, we won those um, competitions before we left out of high school. 
Now, I saw some talk show from way back then that had Miles Davis on it, and they were in, this, in Philly, and they, I remember Joey D was the organ player, and it was some high school kids who were up and coming. Were you in that band? No, that was actually uh, Byron Landum, who was playing Wookie. Joey's band back then as well. With uh, Mick Bry was playing in and out. Like We had different configurations of stuff, so I mm -hmm. played in the all-city jazz band version of that, but then Joey had his own side band that uh, Robert I see. Uh, Byron Landon was playing in then. Byron, name is, his nickname is Wookie. He's a good friend of mine, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was with us when we had our cymbal company. Okay. So you, you, were, you got involved with a, 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 an Ellington repertory ensemble with Wynton Marcellus as a kid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the Marcelluses used to visit our high school, Overbrook High School, and our, um, our, our director, our professor that was there, Dr. George Allen was really good friends with the family, with Ellis, with Wenton, with Delfeo, with Bradford. And um, he invited them to come to the school like he did Miles Davis and Sun Ra and a lot of these other great artists that uh, Sun Ra lived in Philly as well. Um, mm -hmm. They came to visit the school and I got really cool with them and they noticed my playing and was like taking me in like a big, like a little brother. And uh, Wenton came back and said, I want John to play in this Duke Ellington Orchestra along with uh, McBride. And uh, we have Fareed Barron back then um, that was playing piano because Joey was playing for a little bit, but then he had to go out and do his own stuff. And actually he was going, getting ready to go out with Miles at that time. And uh, and th this was pre-Lincoln Center, Winton, right? Yeah, exactly, Winton Marcellus, yep. Yeah, before he ended up doing the real, well, a, a big time repertory Ellington Orchestra that turned into something much more than that, as you know. Exactly. Uh, at Lincoln Center. Um, uh, Duke Ellington's music, we were doing a Nutcracker Suite. That was the main part of that band was playing that music from that uh, particular album. My new site, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, is the perfect online drum learning platform for any level drummer to learn how to play the drums the same way I did, with the advantage of having me road test the material on hundreds of stages, countless clinics, lessons, and master classes, and dozens of studio sessions every year. On the site, you'll find over 13 hours of video, dozens of written lessons, and fresh material gets added all the time. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of you as subscribers on the site, and I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Well, so you have a serious jazz background, traditional jazz. Is there a teacher, a mentor from your early years? Was it family or church, or how'd you get involved in that? Well, the jazz part, you know, after playing in church at my dad's church, I, I just took to playing jazz in the city of Philadelphia, being at the Mellon Jazz Festivals and, you know, playing at um, um, the art school. Uh, what was the art school over there? Oh. University of the Arts, which was down mm -hmm. Um, so I got the, a, a chance to hang out with Mickey Roker and a lot of these amazing drummers from Philadelphia, Byron being one of them too. Um, but when I met Wenton, I, uh, he immediately turned me over to Jeff Tane Watts and Harlan Riley. And so that just changed my life, hanging out with those two guys. Because the thing mm -hmm. about them is that they were jazz drummers, but they could play funk and R&B as, well, just as well. And um, I really took to the style that they were playing, and that's when I started really studying the way that they played. Beautiful. So you ended up going to Berkeley, what, 91, I think, I read? Yep. And did you finish there or get uh, left for the road? Yeah, I stayed there for two years, and then I stayed in Boston for an extra year, and then that's when I made the move to Atlanta. Okay. And uh, pretty. I'm just going to go through a little history stuff, then I want to talk about music and drums but um you worked with will smith and janet jackson right out oh, of college yeah. well i was in working with will smith while i was at berkeley so i was still going back and forth to philadelphia and uh doing stuff with jazzy jeff uh and then turned mm -hmm. into me working with will and jeff together like we did different shows together we did studio we did a record together as well so it just turned into a whole uh, collaboration between me and them. And then I brought a lot of other musicians into the production from Philadelphia. And that's how Touch of Jazz started with Jazzy Jeff. Okay, so what I want to know is how did you fall so easily into the R&B, funk, hip-hop thing as a mainstream acoustic jazz player? <laughs> was that something you always grew up with? Or was it an adjustment you made? or? How did, how did you end up covering so much turf? Well, I think the combination of playing gospel music and playing jazz 
kind of made it easy for me when I went to to start playing R and B and and pop music. You know, it was, they're, they're not too far from each other, especially gospel music, and and especially now how gospel music is being played. But back then, you know, like the groups that I was playing with in Philly then had like a funky edge to it, so it was very R and B ish. Uh, gospel music then so I was very familiar with that style and then when I got into the the full R&B arena I was basically just you know uh, kind of um, I made an easy transition into it. Sound Synergies Procussion Care Lubricants and Conditioners include a series of three products for total drum kit care and maintenance. Pedal Lube, the only product specifically designed for bass drum, hi-hat pedals and triggers, as well as all moving metal parts and drum hardware, safely removes grit, grime and other contaminants while protecting against harmful friction wear. Cymbal Care, restores and conditions cymbal surfaces without strippers or harmful polishes. Wear Barrier is a conditioning formula for all drum heads, rims and even sticks. Procussion Care products in your gig bag ensures your entire kit will always look and sound its best. So let's talk about, let's delve into a little of the, the gospel thing. In the last 10 to 15 years, I'm guessing, roughly, gospel drumming sort of came into its own as a whole viable force. Don't you think? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And there were some changes in the way it was played. How would you, I mean, you, you're, you're considered one of those gospel chop guys, gospel drummers that are so influential today. What are some of the hallmarks of that style for somebody who may not know? Um, well, it all started, the change of the gospel sound started with Edwin Hawkins and Walter Hawkins around that time when they were doing Oh Happy Day back in the 70s or whatever I think it was. Uh, Andre Crouch also was like a pr very exceptional keyboard player, producer. Mm -hmm. The Winans mm -hmm. uh, Commission, who we all followed when we were younger, uh, they were like our age group of, uh, of pop you know, gospel pop stars to us, you know. And so that style is what we, we took to and, and like gravitated to it. The style of Michael Williams playing drums with Commission, uh, Dana Davis who played with the Winans, um, and even our, our one of our peers was Gerald Hayward. He was playing with a, a group called Hezekiah Walker. You, I think you've heard of Gerald Hayward. Sure, yeah. Um, he left the, the gospel field and started playing with Blackstreet and playing with Guy. And so a lot of that style was being, you know, intertwined. And a lot mm -hmm. of the younger guys like myself was checking that out. And our style just started changing just from listening to those guys play. Joel Smith was was a, still is an awesome drummer and bass player who actually plays jazz as well. He played with the Grateful Dead a few times and, you know, did mm -hmm. a lot of records with Santana and people like that. So he was like a, a unsung hero for a lot of us. But the, the drummer community knew who Joel Smith was. Jeff Davis also, who used to teach Gerald Hayward as well. They're all from Jersey and New York. You know, Joel Smith was from the Bay Area. So he was around David Garibaldi and all those guys out there, Tower of Power. Mm -hmm. So you see the connection where it was church and, and the R&B world were like brothers, you know. Well, I love that you're giving cred to all those cats. But let's dig in a little bit, drill down a little bit as drummers. What's different about that style of drumming? Like if I came to you from another, I was a rock drummer, a jazz drummer, or whatever it was, and I said, how do I refine my gospel chops? What is it I need to work on? I have some ideas, but I'd like to hear it from you. Um, well, I can tell you from that era, a lot of us were influenced by New Jack Swing, like Teddy Riley, you know, and mm -hmm. like when Gerald got and started playing with Teddy Riley and those guys, the gospel sound kind of started changing along with the R&B uh, New Jack Swing style. So that So a lot of gospel choirs were playing that groove in their songs. And we started taking to that style. And then, you know, it was like how things merge now with Kirk Franklin and different people that merge the the uh, secular sound in with the gospel sound a lot of that was going on back then as well and and just it opened up a, a whole new sound for like the gospel world and no we weren't trying to like get in bed with the secular world but we were um those influences were coming into the church and it, it reached a lot of the young people back then too as well because it, it, mm -hmm. it was a funky beat it was a danceable beat 
uh, but still the message was was still God and, and the church. Now, I heard that early New Jack Swing stuff is kind of an up-tempo halftime shuffle in that it was swung. The notes were swung inside of it, right? So you got zoom, dot, zoom, but underneath it was tack, 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 tack. And then I heard as it progressed, a lot more influence of, of a double time feel underneath the groove with a lot of ghosted notes and a lot of metric modulation too. Right? Exactly. Kind of James Brownish. I mean, a lot of the New Jack Swing stuff came from the way that James Brown's drummers were playing too. So Teddy Riley was very aware of, of that, that, that style and that groove. Because if you listen to uh, 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 Talking Loud and Saying Nothing, uh, you know, Knife, just ain't cutting. You talking loud and saying nothing, mm -hmm. you know. So it's still that. That was a big church beat. Like when we were doing gospel back then, that was the first thing. Even the tambourine players at church was playing like that. Mm hmm. So remember the time, Michael Jackson. That was that style. And yes, it, it was influenced by jazz as well as that James Brown funk and New Jack Swing all mixed in, in together. And it's not the first time the secular and sacred world have met. I mean, years ago, New Orleans, old, old, old New Orleans, they had, I forgot the name of the church, but it was a church, and on the weekends it was Funky Butt Hall. <laughs> you know that story? I forgot the name of the church. No, I don't know the church, but I do for that story. Yeah. Um, now, when they talk about the one, hitting on the one, yeah. what do they mean by that? Basically, every four beats, that one is going to fall. <laughs> mm -hmm. you hear George mm -hmm. Clinton talk about it. You hear Bootsy Collins talk about it. James Brown was a big advocate of the one because that was the, the cycle of the beat. When it came back around, boom. Mm -hmm. Boom. Now, like you couldn't, you'd have to be crazy to not catch the one. And a lot of cats, you know, we, we try to tell them now, like, look, all that stuff you're doing, don't mean nothing if you don't come back on the one. Or if you don't come back on the one, at least emphasize where the one is, you know. But the one is always there. Hey, everybody out there in cyber world, this is Adam Nussbaum. Hi, Dave Desenzo here. Hi, Bermuda Schwartz here. Hey, everyone, Stanton Moore here. Hey, guys, Johnson Pesta here. Hey, everybody, this is John J.R. Robinson. Hi, Todd Zuckerman here for the Drum Center of Portsmouth. They're knowledgeable, they'll be able to help you and guide you and make the right choices for you and the music that you play. From wingnut to Wuhan, these chaps know what they're talking about. Highly recommended. But what do I know? I'm a drummer. Right, because I hear you displacing one sometimes, but it's still there. As opposed to the New Orleans thing where they talk about the big four, which is actually in halftime, one, two, two, go, two, bop, two, 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 two. It's actually on beat three of every other bar, but it's the thought of as halftime as the big four. I guess you can slice the pie any way you want. If it's funky, it's funky. Right, and then you got the, the four and. One, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Every, every way you cut the pie seems to work if, it, if, it's, if it's working. Now, you've worked with some amazing, amazing, amazing artist. I'm looking at my notes here because there's so many of them. Herbie Hancock, George Duke. I know you work still with George Benson. Quincy Prince, Michael Jackson, Elton John, Patti LaBelle, Earth, Wind & Fire, Joe Sample. Good Lord. Good for you, man. <laughs> uh, how was it working with all those people? Did you Do you get to the point where you have a reputation and you come in and they want you to be you? Or is there a lot of instruction and uh, uh, guidance from each of these artists as to what they want from you? Yeah, it's both. It's a combination of both. Um, and I've been fortunate to have worked with some of the nicest genius individuals, you know, I, like I can't even go any less than what I've been at as far as like the humbleness and the attitude of these people, the graciousness. Um, and it just made the environment so easy to work in and mm -hmm. the nervousness that I would have playing with a George Duke or a George Benson or a Joe Sample, you know, or even recording for Michael Jackson. These people were so nice and so loving that it just made you it made you play better. 
you know, it's hard to play with, with somebody that's on your back like, hey, 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 oh, no, you're messing up. And, uh, uh, everything is just negative energy and, you know, it just messes the whole vibe up, you know, because a lot of this stuff comes from good vibes. The music comes from good vibes first, you know. And There's an old school feel, fear and intimidation method of leading a band that goes back to like Tommy Dorsey and Buddy Rich and all kinds of things like that where somebody's in your face and, and I, I've always thought it was the wrong approach to music. So you're working now with Stevie Wonder, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I was definitely on tour with him with the uh, Songs in the Key of Life tour and that's a moment that I'll never forget. It was most, uh, it was the most awesome, one of the most awesome experiences in my career. I can barely say the name without, you know, genuflecting. <laughs> He's just that heavy, man. And and when you did you record with him as well? I didn't record with him. Um, I really just came in for that specific tour. I think uh, him and uh, Greg Fillingains, the great Phil, uh, Greg Fillingains, talked about having Keyboard two drummers. Yeah, and having two drummers on the tour um, because Stanley Randolph is his 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 regular drummer, uh, great drummer, good friend of mine. And um, they called me and said, well, we want you to come in and play second drums with Stanley, you know. And it, it morphed into a really cool thing because at first I felt kind of weird, like, OK, I'm coming in on somebody else's gig, you know, whatever. Mm. But, you know, Stanley was really cool about it. And once we got into rehearsal, we realized what it is that they were trying to accomplish. And basically kind of like Gl uh, Clyde and Jabbo, because that's how we were preparing right. ourselves in that tour. We were calling ourselves the, the new generation Clyde and Jabo. <laughs> but when we got to rehearsals, we realized you play this part, I'm going to play this part. Some songs I'm not playing, some songs he's played, some songs I play, he didn't play. And that was up to Stevie and, and Greg when they put it all together. But when you heard it, if you can go on YouTube and check us out from 2014, you could see where we were really complimenting each other in the groove you know some songs that we played together if he's on the ride i went to the hi-hat we didn't both play the same thing at the same time uh some things i let him take the lead playing the uh the the, the main beat and i might have been playing some of the fills and stuff and just staying out off the snare you know maybe doing a hi-hat or something but it just created this really big big sound between the both of us and it was locked well, it would have to be locked. Speaking of that, let me ask you about what I consider production-based music, where when you go out with these cats, there's a lot going on, right? There's uh, tracks or loops or lights or dancers or set pieces. There's all kinds of stuff, and it's pretty much on a grid, right? Oh, yeah. So it was coming from a... I think a lot of drummers, have, you got to think about that differently. It's not a question of without the click without the grid it speeds up or slows down it's just a different way of a, defining the beat within that grid that a lot of younger players are, are more adept at was that a challenge or a difficult transition for you it actually wasn't as much of a challenge because in college and even before college i was always used to playing to metronomes and and drum machines and things like that so when i got into a situation like a janet situation it, it I easily took to it because I was already practicing to those kind of loops and things. The only thing that was different for me was when I first started with her, I was 23 years old. I had never used in-ear monitors. And so that was an opening experience for me because once I started in rehearsal, I heard the click, I heard the tracks, I heard all this stuff going on and I had to figure out what made sense balance wise for me to fit in mm -hmm. with everything else that was going on and lock in with everything as well. Lock in with the click, you know, and even sometimes I had to play around with the click because some things might not have been straight on it. Like some of the, some of the loops might've been a little behind or something. So sometimes I had to pull back on the click instead of playing right on top of it. You know, so it, it, it's like it's a um, it's definitely a method to the madness of, of doing plans to those things. I think it's easier now because people have the technology has gotten so much better now. And everything's right. like kind of perfectly on the grid now. Back then in 93 or 94, you know, we were still dealing with uh, not the type of technology that we have now. You know, mm -hmm. I don't even know. If, I don't think we have Pro Tools. I think we were using like Digital Performer or something like that, whatever was they were using in the early 90s that's what we were using 
And uh, so now everything is much easier to play to. The clicks are there, the background vocals or whatever is pre-recorded. You know, it's easier for you to lock to those things now. Mm -hmm. And it makes for a great a performance and a great event for the audience. I don't think it detracts in any way. Uh, that lends that leads me to electronics. You use electronic drums. You're you're adept at those as well, right? Oh, you got to use electronics on, on especially on Janet's gig, because um, most of it really I could I could strike the rest of the drum set away, and use kick, snare, and hat and and a pad. Um, the toms are really just some extra extra you know icing on the cake to make it sound a little more fuller and stuff instead of me just playing two and four or playing the grooves from the records um that's just you know little transitions here and there but a lot of it is electronic kick electronic snare and electronic pad now if you're playing in a local band and you're trying to cover those songs it almost demands those sounds right i mean i can't you can't just play a bass drum and snare drum and really accurately reproduce that Right, you'll sound like a a, a cover band. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and a lot of it's just the sounds you don't have dialed in. Now, do you use uh, the sounds? You're not using the sounds that come in the modules, are you? Uh, the sounds come directly from Jimmy and, and Terry, uh, Jimmy Jam mm -hmm. and Terry Lewis, uh, from the old files and stuff from their from right. record uh, tapes and stuff. And then we dump them into the, uh, I'm using a Yamaha DTX uh, module. Um, I used to use um, uh, drum cats and things like that, but now I've, I've now the technology, like I said, has gotten so much better. I've been able mm -hmm. to take all of the sounds that I'm using and throw it into the mother brain that I'm using, which is a, 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 a 900 a multi a DTX multi 900. That one right behind me, and and I think it's important that guys realize that uh, it's good to get away. From the, the sounds in it are fine; they're meant to just turn it on and play. But there are also so many other cool ways to go with importing sounds or using software sounds. I know I, I work with BFD3, and I rarely use the internal sounds. No, no slight on Yamaha. They're great sounds already. Okay. But uh, most of the pro world out there is using their own sounds, right? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Point worth mentioning. Point worth mentioning. So are you adept at studio knowledge, you know, microphones and boards and gear and all that stuff? I'm um, not much of a, a studio geek as far as those things are concerned. I mean, I ask questions when I'm doing certain records and I see certain mics. I'm like, what, is, what mic is that or whatever? But no, I would totally be lost in a conversation about mics and, and gear. <laughs> Preamps and all that stuff. I know it's a different language, uh, but it seems a lot of young drummers are becoming more and more familiar with that and looking at it less as somebody else's gig. Right. Yeah. Uh, to catch up in that area my, myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, some advice to young players coming along? Um, the young players. Do you teach at all? Oh, yeah, I teach a lot. When I'm home, like right now, I have like about 10 students that I'm in circulation with. Um, but I, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are they local or do you do Skype lessons? or? No, I, they're local. And in okay. different cities, and I have a day off, I do take lessons with other people. But, um, I would tell most of the younger cats about their attitude, mainly first, which means everything outside of just being able to play. Um, you know, a lot of gigs that I might do sometimes, it might not just be because of my playing. It, it's, some of it is because of my attitude and just being a cool person and easy to get along with and easy to work with. Some guys I know won't get as many gigs because of their attitudes. So um, I would people tell forget People forget that when you're on the road, man, that's a family. Uh -oh. You got to get along in the bus, you know. You got to get along all day. You're only on stage 90 minutes. The rest of it is a family. Exactly. Well, you would hope it's a family because there's some people that you get on the road with that you know you you don't never seen before or don't know nothing about, and you got to basically get along with them on a tour bus for hours in between show days and and this cities and everything. So, yeah, you're right. It's, it has a lot to do with with the camaraderie and the family orientation type vibe yeah mm -hmm. well i don't like these shows to go too long i don't want to keep you too long i also, also want to make sure you feel welcome to come back and do others oh, so especially living in atlanta man i gotta let's get together and hang i'll owe you, owe you a drink or a lunch or a coffee or something <laughs> did, did you play locally at all um i don't play locally as much as i used to uh, this, 
the the music scenes kind of changed through the years. You know, I used to play a lot, especially through the '90s and summer 2000. But um, now, when I come home, I'm working out. You know, I, I practice with the students that I have, mm -hmm. um, and every now and then I'll do some gigs, like special stuff. Like recently, I did a, a Jeff Carl tribute with uh, John Childen. Is that how you say? It? John Childen, Brian Stevens. I knew about that. I wasn't able to go. I wanted to. I heard you tore it up, man. Oh, man, it was great, man. And, and it's a great thing that they're doing. They're getting ready to do another one, I think, a tribute to Steve Gadd. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I'll probably try to do that one as well. Um, I think it's in April. But um, uh, I just talked to Wafredo Race uh, Sr. He's supposed to come and do it as well. Um, Great. Yes, yeah, certain uh, shows, like special shows like that, I'll do. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll go somewhere and jam with some of the bands that are playing here, you know. But, um, yeah, I'm, I'm not as active locally as I used to be. Well, there's not as much as there used to be. I used to do 300 gigs a year locally here. Uh -huh. Now I look back and go... Why? <laughs> Why did I do all those things? Anyway, uh, it, it's it's not what it was, and, and uh, I don't know that it ever will be again. But um, I'm going to let you go. I really appreciate you doing my show, and it's great insight you've given me into your world. And continued success, man. You're a wonderful drummer. Yeah, thank um, you. Uh, who's, who's up next for you? Um, right now, I'm still doing spot dates with George Benson. Um, you know, like I'm doing the uh, Seth Meyers show soon. I'm not oh, you are? I'm not supposed to announce that until the week of, but now you know. <laughs> but, yeah. Well, at least th this won't be out for several weeks, so you, okay. you might have already done it. I, I met that guy at NAMM who books those uh, books the drummers on that show. Oh, okay, cool. I can't remember his name. Anyway, sure. thanks a lot, little John. I really appreciate it, and, and let's keep in touch, all right? Oh, yeah. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me, Michael. Catch you on the flip. Okay, take care, bro. This is your host, Michael Vosbein, and I'd like to thank our friends at Sabian Symbols, Sound Synergies, Stanton Moore Drum Academy, and Drum Center of Portsmouth. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.